From Los Angeles, the home of film and television, this is Film Music Live, a webcast featuring outstanding composers, orchestrators, filmmakers, and more from the world of music for film, television, and video games, talking about their work and answering your questions. Film Music Live is sponsored by the Film Music Network and Film Music Institute. And now the host of Film Music Live, Daniel Schweiger. Hey everyone, I'm Daniel Schweiger, and welcome to Film Music Live, the show where you get to ask the questions to today's top composers. I'm happy to have you here. You could say that Mark Mothersbaugh defined the synth new wave pop sound of the 70s when fronting the iconically comic new wave band Devo. He's since more than proven himself as a film composer whose work has no shortage of arc humor, really coming into his own as the classically hip voice of Wes Anderson for the likes of Bottle Rocket, Rushmore, and the Royal Tenenbaums, as well as being the antic playmate of the Rugrats' little and big screen adventures. In well over a hundred soundtracks of varying styles, the energetically busy mother spa has embodied the man-child Pee Wee Herman, played misunderstood teens from 13 to the Lords of Dogtown, goofed on 21 Jump Street, been accompanied by multiple wives in Big Love, taken animation scoring to the outer limits with Cloudy with the Chance of Meatballs, the Lego Movie, and the Mitchells vs. the Machines, and hit lowbrow reality with Dirty John and the Tiger King. Tying all of his work together is an eccentric sound which hit a new level of hipness with the retro arcade superhero score of Thor Ragnarok. That gleeful throwback spirit is now on overblow to provide a delightfully faux fearsome comic high for a cocaine bear. Taking the anticlimactic facts of what really happened when a bear ate dumb stash in the 80s, director Elizabeth Banks spins a nature revenge rampage of terrified mountain residents, pissed off drug dealers, and an even more enraged bear high on their supply with the real case of the munchies. It's the perfect opportunity for Mother Spa to break out his retro arsenal of era-perfect synths, guitars swinging from the rustic to spaghetti western showdowns, tango rhythms, and the fearsome orchestra for a pitch-perfect salute to Nature Revenge movies, while at the same time saluting an era whose sound he helped pioneer in a whole other medium. It's a soundtrack that shows Mark Mothersbaugh is as creatively hungry as ever in the killer paws of Cocaine Bear. And now let's welcome a musician who knows more than something about wildly insane, tripped-out music, Mark Mothersbaugh. Hey, hello, how are you? Great having you here, Mark. Well, well, it's about you know, time. <laughs> I'm trying to get you for years, man. No, but you, I, you finally worked your way down the ladder far enough that you got to me. So I, I have, I have devolved, and I mean, congratulations on this weekend. I mean, Cocaine Bear, dude. It's like you say, snakes on a plane, and you just have to see the movie. I mean, now when someone tells you, "I want you to score a movie called Cocaine Bear," what do you think? Um. Well, it was it was where it was coming from. Um, I've worked with Elizabeth Banks on uh, other films. We we did uh, Pitch Perfect, and and I scored uh, films that she was uh, an actress in. And so um, I knew her sense of humor, and she's kind of like a like a Lucille Ball, the the modern Lucille Ball of Hollywood in a way. You know, um, very Renaissance woman doing a lot of different things at once. And I thought, yeah, I'll I'll, I'll try this and. And Chris and Phil, uh, who I've worked with on, I don't know, like 15 films now, including a couple of them that you had in that thing you just ran by. Um, it's like um, it was a good crowd to be associated with. So um, I, I, when, when they showed it to me, I wasn't disappointed. <laughs> You know, what's interesting is that I think, you know, going back a bit, you know, one of the really kind of distinctively fun um, scores I heard from a Marvel movie was uh, Thor Ragnarok, where you brought in this whole kind of Atari 8-bit aesthetic uh, to it. And, you know, when you go right back to Devo, Devo really was the band uh, that kind of encapsulated that synth, you know, back then it wasn't retro sound. Uh, that you've kind of brought back to the fore, you know, with the score and and with Thor. Um, back in the days of Devo, did you guys like have any kind of sense that you were like pioneering something with that, you know, with that kind of eight bit sound? 
Uh, but that was um, it was um, a goal actually. Um, when I met um, Jerry Casali and Bob Lewis, who were uh, they were um, grad students at Kent State, and I was a freshman or a sophomore, and we started talking about mu music. Uh, we were we were all vi uh, Jerry and I were both visual artists, and and I liked those guys because they were starting to put some things together that kind of sound like like um neo beatnik at the time they were and i was kind of personally kind of interested in beatnik poetry and beat, beatnik writing because it was kind of critical of the human consciousness you know that that was like that was like endangering the planet and uh just was there was something about those guys that made me want to work with them and then they were like doing these things that were like kind of bar napkin, tinker toy kind of songs. The, the music was very simplistic, but the lyrics were kind of um, a beatnik style. Like if you, if you go back and listen to the Devo song, um, Be Stiff, for instance, you'd get the idea of what I'm talking about. And I was looking for a way to bring a new sound into into pop music. Uh, I'm just telling you what, what the way I thought. I was I was a student at Kent and I was, infatuated with um, uh, like the Italian futurist approach to music uh, with ballet mechanique and, and also just, they, they made this statement like, the modern orchestra does not contain the instruments that can create the sounds that properly illuminate a industrial society. And so they were using like um, bicycle spokes and, uh, and um, fog horns and things like that in their music and I thought, well, what's the 1972 version of that? And to me, that was that was electronics. And I was really infatuated with electronics. And I was looking for ways different than the way people were using electronics at that time. It's like people like Rick Wakeman and Keith Emerson were like making them sound like glorified um, pipe organs. You know, they didn't really add anything new to the uh, soundscape. And... Uh, I started paying attention to people like uh, like John Cage. And then I remember the first Roxy music came out and Brian Eno was playing uh, a synth solo on a kind of boring song called Editions of You. It was like a throwaway. It was like a throwaway B-side kind of song. And there were some solos. And when he did the synth solo, he made a synth solo that totally changed the way uh, any instrument had been used in pop music up to that time. And I thought, oh, that's close to what I'm into because I was making um, V2 rocket sounds. I was looking for mortar blasts. I, I was, you know, like concerned about the Vietnam War and just the human condition in general and the way Madison Avenue had kind of like, had kind of like subversively, you know, homeswagged people to... Uh, to you know like uh, buying things they didn't need or liking things they shouldn't have they shouldn't like and i thought i want to i want to do something with music where we we make people think about good things or important things like like questioning uh you know why we are here on the planet in the first place as humans and and uh why are we the unnatural species? Why are we the only species out of touch with nature that's destroying things? And so we, you know, early on, I was like making sounds that were like uh, ray guns, you know, like a woo, like an alien ray gun over top of space girls or something, or like um, dinosaurs tromping through the woods or like, uh, you know, you know, a big, splashes and and blats and blasts that that were not were not um of the uh of the vernacular uh, of, they were not of something that sounded like it came out of the the toolkit for for making pop music and uh yeah we were always thinking about stuff like that from the very beginning well thanks to back 
Well, thanks to uh, Backlot Records, we've got five downloads of Cocaine Bear to give out. And here is our first question. It's from the Bond music or Ivan Sorkin. Um, Mark, your filmography is really amazing. Comedies, action, animation. But which genre is more close to you? Which film you agreed to score with more pleasure? Or does it depend on the story or the script? You know, it's like... um. I, I don't know. My resume, I was looking at it. It's, it doesn't even, we don't even include everything on it. It's too big of a, it's, you know, I've done maybe between feature films, art films, uh, video games, and I'm, I'm you know, like a, a barrel full of t television shows and, and things, you know, I, I probably got like, I don't know, 175 or more of all those genres, you know, put together. And um, I'm kind of like old enough now that I, I kind of try to get a sense of what the people are like I'm going to be working with. And, and I listen to the questions they ask me and um, the things they tell me about, about the project. And I, I leave the first meeting going, you know, I think this these people are going to be no fun to work with, or I think these people are interesting, you know, and it's like, I have to say there are a lot of interesting artists uh, that work in, in film and television. So, so, um, you know, Devo was, was like two sets of brothers, you know, it was at one point it was Jerry and me and my two brothers. And then, then we added his brother and dropped one of my brothers and uh, so there was always brothers involved, but it, but it really made it easier to, to collaborate. And um, we decided early on that we would just split the publishing. So there was no thing like where like Sting gets all the money, you know, that, that you know, uh, the police made or any of that kind of stuff. And so we, we made it so people would want to collaborate and want to um, add to the music. And so I'm, I've always been into collaboration and, and I enjoy it. It's an interesting to talk to, you know, two different directors and they say, we want you to make this darker or we want you, we want you to make this um, sneakier or something like that. And, and they mean different things. You, you have to figure out, you, you figure out what they're talking about. That's, and the first film is always part of, you know, like learning what that is. And then the second film is 10 times easier because you already have a, you already know their their vocabulary and what they mean. Now we've got a question from uh, Jake Wright, and he would like to know what was it like creating a score in this case, obviously Cocaine Bear, that mixes an orchestra with guitars and synths, but also scoring the comedy and the emotional scenes. I mean, really, the balance of all the different tones in the film. Yeah, um, I'll tell you, this film was easier than than a lot of films, and. Part of the reason is, is because I do so much animation and animation now has gotten to the point where I'm scoring storyboards that are black and white drawings that, you know, move really stiff. They're, they're like stiffer than anything Hanna-Barbera ever put out. Uh, and they're, you know, and sometimes you're looking and you see a little like, like squiggle in the corner of the, of the of an image and you're like what is that and then you find out that's a flock of birds that's going to come in and go over top of everything and you you need to accentuate that in the music but you don't know it oftentimes when you first see your you know the first animatics for animation and then it's like not until i mean i don't even see some of the finished animation till after i've been to abbey or air studio wherever i'm recording and and um we come back with the score and then they start filling in the animation. And then I'm like, Oh, I got to add something, you know, with a synth or I got to add a, have a couple violin players come in and, and do something that that's happening in the picture that I didn't see before, you know? And so this movie was easier because they had it pretty much a final cut before they called me up, which that's how they used to do it in the old days, you know, like 20, 25 years ago, they would do that 30 years ago. You'd get a picture it was pretty much cut and animation was even cut because it took so long to do animation 30 years ago that they couldn't do the last minute hairpin changes that they can do now. So, so um, this movie, it was already really well formed and um, Elizabeth and uh, Chris and Phil, they're, they're, you know, 
I've worked with them and I know know how to talk with them about music and I know what they mean. And she's she was very articulate and um, it was, you know, like uh, pretty much there, there was one thing that got changed uh, after they went to their mix and they, they had another idea and um, they 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 changed. And, and in the film, you don't really notice it that much because there wasn't much they could do because it was animation coming in late. The, the bear was total animation. But they decided not until like the 11th hour that, wait a minute, what if we swap it so the bear is the, is the hero at the end? And they, they hadn't thought about that when they were shooting it. And so the darkest, most meanest, evil, most aggressive, most slobbering version of the bear you know, is at the very end of the film. And, uh, but then they wanted it, they wanted to swap it so that Ray Liotta becomes like the bad guy. Right. And uh, so I helped him as much as I could. I did what I could. I couldn't make the bear not slobber or not, not look more vicious than it looked to the rest of the film, but musically put a little bit of like a Superman or something when, when she's laying, uh, I'm not giving anything away. Well, because I think you've seen it in the, the trailers, but where she's, like fall, she gets shot by Ray Liotta and falls off a off a waterfall and hits, hits a ledge down below and she's unconscious until he accidentally breaks open some of the one of the kilos of cocaine and it you see it drift down and there's a close up of, of, of a profile of her and she snorts the cocaine as it comes in the air and she wakes up again and has renewed energy and climbs back up the hill and that so starting there she becomes like the yeah the, uh, there's a little bit. I, I made it a little less evil and a little less uh, dark the, and menacing her her um, theme and made it just a little more like you could cheer for her. You know, I made it a little more of that. And she goes up to protect her cubs and eviscerate Ray Liotta in his final scene in a movie. <laughs> Where, what, what a way to go. <laughs> I know. I'm sure that I'm sure that what I mean, you know, whatever was happening when he was like, um, you know, transitioning from being alive to wherever you go next, you know, whatever happens next, even if it's nothing, I'm sure that flashed in his head that that <laughs> that that's going to be the last thing people uh, see that that I'm in, and um, he must have got a laugh out of that. I'm sure. Now we've got a question from uh, Louis Versalini. Um, hey, Mark, I really enjoyed the soundtrack to Cocaine Bear, and I'm a huge fan of all your music. Now, when scoring Cocaine Bear, did you have to go back and listen to any 80s music or retro devo for inspiration or ideas? Listening to the score, it sounds like you had a lot of fun scoring. Also, it's high time Devo was elected into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, don't you think? Well, okay. Um, let's see. Yeah, it, it, the, the original story, which has been greatly twisted and elaborated on to make this movie, did happen in the 80s. So, so it was set back there. So it gave me an excuse to go down in the basement, uh, in the building where I'm at with this gray and orange looking room you see me in that looks so dull. Downstairs are a road case full of Devo gear. And I went rummaging through because I'm the one who's been the archivist for the band really for the last 50 years. This is our 50 year anniversary. Um, uh, and I pulled out some synths that we did albums in the 80s on and brought them upstairs here. And uh, well, you can't see them in, in this room right now. They're, they've been moved out. I have a very efficient crew. They don't leave some things sitting around. but. Um, so I did go back and use 80s sounds that came out of Devo that were like, you know, you would recognize some Devo songs if you listen to the soundtrack and listen to Devo, except we never used an orchestra in Devo. But, um, uh, and then what was the second half? The second, oh, the Rock and Roll Hall. Okay, here's, here's what my, my plan is. I'm, you know, in some ways, you know, I, um, I love Johnny Rotten's, um, comment he made where he said if we ever got in the rock and roll hall of fame i would just wonder what we did wrong and uh I, which always cracked me up but but um now that we've been rejected three times uh 
I, I've got this idea. There's a parking lot that's next door to the museum. And I'm going to, I'm saving money. I'm going to buy one of those spaces in the parking lot that are, that are, uh, that are touching, you know, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame building. And um, Ohio has very lenient burial laws, believe it or not. You can bury, if you, if you petition for it, you can bury a relative or a loved one in your yard in Ohio. Who would have known, right? It's, you can't do that everywhere. But in Ohio, you can. Um, probably because there was a lot of farmland at one time. It still is a lot of farmland in Ohio. So they probably just say, well, put them on the farm. It's cheaper and easier. But um, I thought, we start putting Devo guys. We just, you know, maybe we have to dig long, straight holes, you know, and just drop them down in, you know, as, as, as we move along like Ray Liotta did recently you know it's like you just drop us down in there and devo could be rock and roll hall of fame adjacent you know we we may not be in the rock and roll hall of fame but we could be rock and roll hall of fame adjacent and so that's my plan uh, is that's plan b since we've been uh we failed to make the cut three times in a row now so they're idiots uh, <laughs> you'll haunt you'll haunt them though your your spirits will uh, haunt them next door um you know it's interesting this is really essentially your first outright horror movie uh since way back in the day when you did slaughterhouse rock i think and dead man on campus um there were a and few things in between i did some like kind of a gosh i did a film with jason state and i can't remember what the name Safe, was. uh which is great but that's not like a horror film, though. But it's a it wasn't horror. You're right. You're right. It wasn't a horror film. Yeah, but it's a yeah, great film know. and a great score. Horror films scare me. So, so. Although this one I kind of liked because it was kind of fun. It was more funny to me. This movie was funny because it's like you see a lot of stupid people doing one dumbass thing before they get killed uh, in some grotesque manner by a barrier, and it's hard to like go, "Oh, I'm so sorry that that dumbass yeah. like," you know. So. I mean, you know, the totally it's really and you really pull it off, you know, because it points the bear has to be legitimately scary. You know, you have to literally have legitimate suspense, but then you've got, you know, these wacky, eccentric characters. I mean, you know, what was it like to achieve that kind of balance? You know, it's not to be completely stupid where you wouldn't take anything seriously. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you how I work is write things. I'm pretty thematic. I like to use themes. So like. Cocaine Bear had a theme from the very beginning, but um, it got, you know, it's like you decide what your final mix is as you're getting, as all the pieces of music are filling in the space and you're hearing the whole movie in total. Like when you're just looking at one scene, you know, like, like a picture editor does over and over and over again, they look at one scene and then they put a piece of music in for tempo and for other things, but it might not fit, you know, it might look like a patchwork quilt, you know, when you listen to the film with just all temp music in it. But this, you have to like, um, you know, you have to have a, an overarching idea and, and it starts coming into focus as you go. And the, the mixing has a lot to do with it. Um, Chris and Phil, uh, who produced it, um, I've scored, I don't know how many films with them because I did I did all the Lego movies, and I did, you know, 21 and 22 Jump Street, and I did the, uh, the Meatballs, and, and I've done other things, you know, um, Mitchell's Roots and Scenes, I've done other things with them, and uh, it's like, I, they get ideas, and they tune, they, they fine-tune their humor when they're on the mix stage at the end, and you're supposed to, like, have everything all figured out by then, but nope, they, they wait till then, and then they, they change you know, they, they they change gears or they they come up with another concept of where to go. Like like a good example is the idea of making the bear, you know, like a you know more of a agonist, you know, less of a less of a villain. And um, uh, so I'm used to working with them and giving them scores, a score where I, I deliver to the soundstage over a hundred stems you know, a uh, hundred channels where I divide up all the orchestra and I add on to it electronics. I add on to it other instruments, you know, ethnic things. And I give them different ways to get in and out. 
And my music editor is really important uh, at that point because he's on the soundstage and they're saying, wait a minute, it should be an abrupt cult cut right here instead of the full orchestra just barreling on. And I got this guy, he takes his scissors and he takes my music and, goes, and cuts it down for me. And uh, so I bought to him uh, and, and just, you know, I just try to give my directors and producers as much ammo as I can, or as many arrows in their their quiver as, as I can. So when they get that mix, they're they're not like looking for the music, and going, what well, what can we do to make the music hit a little harder? What can we do to make it, you know, like um, sadder or, or anything, you know, any of that stuff. And so I try to I try to anticipate the different things they could need, and I try to over deliver so that. They're just like, um, they're doing reductive synthesis at that point. Now, when it comes to the main theme, now Esteban Cortes would love to know, what's the main instrument used to play the Bears theme and why? Okay, um, it had a lot to do with the way they shot the film, but also I was just looking for the, the main, th there's a couple themes. There's themes for some of the, you know, for the, the hapless lovers up at the beginning, uh, there's uh, themes for the family. Uh, Ray has a theme. Uh, the 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 black cop that that gets shot on the on the roof of the gazebo out in the woods has has a theme. Um, you know, even uh, you know even his his son and um, and his uh, the, the the other kid that worked for him they have they have a theme. But for the bear which was kind of the most important one to me. It was very simple. It's just like, bomb, bomb. And then, then some, some uh, horns, or something. And it's really simple. It's only like a few things. It's like, if, so like later on in the film, if you hear, bum, bum, you know that means it's the bear. And it's, you know, it's like just some big drums and uh, some low strings and, and uh, brass. And, and then they play, play a little, warning refrain or they don't uh, sometimes we i just let the warning refrain out and, and um because i love themes i i don't know why but i do i like melodies i like themes now stanley crandall uh would love to know now since there has often been an element of humor in your work what is your orientation to and influences in humor and how do you manifest that in your music hmm I watch the news. Uh, oh, I don't know. I, I think um, I think just the interaction of humans is is humorous enough. The way the way people do things, the way way, way people make decisions, and um, I don't know. It humans always freaked me out and amazed me and. Uh, disappointed me with their not living up to their potential. And um, I don't know. Uh, I think the humans are what make me laugh. Now, where the heck did the spaghetti Western uh, isms come into the score? How, what, what inspired that? Um, it's, it's not a lot. And that's kind of more around uh, the cop that gets killed on the roof of the gazebo. It's kind of like, it's kind of like his thing, and and you wouldn't think of it. He's like an older, overweight um, uh, black man detective, and uh, attach him to like a Clint Eastwood kind of theme. Uh, it just kind of somehow it kind of um, to me. It, I just felt like it illustrated his um, his um, personality because like he has this little dog there's a whole story behind it he wanted to get a dog and uh somehow he ended up with like this little i i think it's called a shih tzu appropriately but it's uh this little white thing that looks like it belongs on the end of a dust mop it, and it's like um i think he was thinking he was gonna you know he was thinking like all dogs are like labradors or something and and um I think he was a little bit disappointed with his dog because it didn't fetch. And, um, and he just had like, um, he had, he was like a, a person that really good at heart. And um, he was around a lot of, 
there's a lot of shit heels in this film and he's not one of them. He's one of the really nice guys. Um, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Somehow played that. And while he was laying on the roof, staring at the sky about to die, it was, um, it seemed like uh, it was a nice fit. I don't know. What'd you guys think? Oh, I thought it was inspired. I thought, I thought it was absolutely hilarious, and and I wasn't. I thought it was almost like the showdown at the ending between you know uh, Ray Liotta, you know. But again, it just it just like so much of the yeah, charm. you're right. It's like that's where it showed up. Like uh, Ray yeah. is there, and and you know, it's like yeah, that's the point where where um he, he gets shooting the guy. Up he, and, yeah, he shoots him, and he shouldn't have. Yeah, yeah. I, <laughs> he, 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 he was just being a he was just being a badass not nice um, drug dealer. That, at that point, you really, it's, he cements his, he cements your image of him at that point. And then you just see him, he keeps playing on it when he's trying to kill the, the cubs and stuff like that. Yeah. Now, James Anthony Phillips would love to know. I mean, I think you've got some Devo dates coming up, but are you ever interested in going on a consort tour? I mean, you certainly have more than enough film music to do it with. Uh, hmm. You know, uh, I know other people do it. You know, I know Danny did it and I, I think he had a good time doing it. Uh, we didn't, we didn't talk in detail about it, but I, uh, we were both at, um, uh, there's a drummer we share for different things that, uh, we were at his birthday party about a month ago and we, we were just talking about some things and we, we decided we'd get together soon. And of course we haven't, neither of us has called the other one yet, but, um, cause we're both working all the time, but you know, it's like, um, I don't know, that interests me, you know, it, it, it interests me. And, and I feel like I, I would have a wider range than, than some other people for, for what you could do with something like that. I, I don't, do they make money? I have no idea. It seems like it would be expensive to have like 60 people on a, on a, stage you know yeah that's prevent that's prevented some people i think from doing it is the the expense but you know again you know there are a lot of really fantastic you know concerts like hans zimmer and you know those folks you know mm -hmm. but it's it's always fun you know and i've seen smaller composers like clint mansell do it and it's terrific so it just depends i guess and how did clint do it? did he use an orchestra or was yeah. it more of a band it was amazing it was in it, i think it, maybe it was at the mayan in downtown los angeles it happened like maybe about 15 years ago but it was phenomenal amazing and again you had a completely different audience show up for it because it was like a much younger audience in a way than yeah. would show up you know for other for other stuff interesting i like him you know i would i would i would have gone to that one yeah, no, it's really cool. So we got a question from Doom Boogie. Uh, when approaching a new film, do you have a process for finding that specific sound for the project? A lot of your work is a distinct character, and I'm curious where that all brews. Um, I mean, there's a lot of it that's on purpose, and you look for clues, you know, first in the script, and then you read a script and you go, God, this script's great. Now, how are they going to fuck up this film? And then and then you um, see the film and you go, oh, that's how they're going to screw it up. But um, oftentimes you see something and it comes out great. And then to me, I, I really am affected by visuals. Uh, visuals really have a lot more to inspire me than a script, for instance, uh, because um, it's the pacing and the coloration of everything. It, it's like, you know, you, you, some, you know, you read a script and you try to guess what it's going to be like and you, you you often get you know surprised you know and and i like it when that happens um uh oh what was the question again it was about oh then how do you come up with the thing you know and then some of it's random like for instance i, I don't know if it'll go in if i can pull this into the to the shot right now, but i'll show you something i got this thing here it's an instrument called a pan optagon and it it's like this I just got it like last year and I there's this instrument that was like a toy that Mattel put out in 1970 called Optagon and what it was was a little small chintzy organ that plays um I got I got that actually over there it's like there was it was like for a few hundred bucks you could buy this little organ and you put in magneto optical discs and you'd hit a button and instead of it just playing like organ sounds you know with rhythms on it 
it would play like, um, here, let me show you one, the cover on this. Like it would play like, that came out in 1971. And so the disc that you slide into this thing, it's like, can you see that it's like, it's magneto optical tracks like films used to have in the old days. Um, anyhow, this, and when you hit the button, instead of it being like a piano or some synths or whatever, going boom, get, boom, it goes da -do -wa -da -da, da -do -wa -da -da. and then you have all the chords like on an accordion, you know, you have all the chords, like, and then you can go to another chord. Dee -dee -dee -da -da. The, it's it's so awesome an instrument. It's most of them have been junk. And here's another disc, a Polynesian Village. And so there's like these percussion things, you know. And then and then when you hit the buttons, it's like and it's um marimbas and things that you couldn't really do on an electronic. Organ. And uh, so I I got this panopticon. There's these crazy guys and. God, where are they at? They're somewhere El Segundo or something like that. They're somewhere like that. And they they fell in love with that Mattel thing and they built this updated um, turntable to play those discs and add effects and all this stuff. And I got I was having so much fun with that last year that when I got offered this TV show, it hasn't come out yet. It's called um, Hello Tomorrow, I think is what the title is going to be when it, when it premieres this I think summer, fall, I don't know, you know, schedules are so unpredictable these days, you know, with all the new channels and, and uh, with all the new viruses, you know, it's like between the two of them, it changes everything. But um, I started playing them this stuff and it just sounds so old and like, uh, cause it was written a lot. It's people playing back in 1970, you know, and uh, there, and um you're just hitting buttons for the chords and then you play your melody over top of it, whatever it is. And it just, it just sounded like they, they couldn't figure out how I made it sound so retro, you know, how it sounded. And it was just this really cool machine. that was like, if you go to the right Salvation Army or, or junk store, you can buy, pick one up for a couple hundred bucks. You know, Hello Tomorrow is actually on, I believe it's on Hulu, I think. Uh, but it is on. I, I read it's it on already. Oh, oh. It is, yeah. well, sorry. Hello tomorrow. I. I... <laughs> it might be. I hope. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. Now Dale's got a question. Can you explain your hilarious mission with using the sentence "We smell sausage" and reveal any recent scores or songs where you snuck it in? Okay, I haven't used it recently, but it did show up in like things like. Um, a Disney series I was doing and it showed up in um, Pee Wee's Playhouse and uh, stuff like that. But what it was is like in the very, very early days of sampling and you'd only get like a two second sample on an emulator, for instance, back in those days or three second or so, I think two or um, they were really short. And I was just really fascinated to like, to, to like find out that, you know, Devo was you know, what? you know, backwards. <laughs> and, 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 um, and at the time when emulators and things like that first came out, there was this whole thing about how the early, early days of, um, of uh, dark, sinister, uh, heavy metal, dark music like this, you know, like the evil music of like, um, I'm thinking I'm talking about like, 89 or 87 or something like 80, 89 or so. And so I had this emulator and I thought, well, you know, they're talking about devil masking, you know, backwards, you know, like, like the word devil or Satan or, or murder or kill, you know, like, and I, you know, in backwards in these heavy metal songs, I thought, well, what would be, well, what's the opposite of that? What would be like Christian backward masking? So I put in, Jesus loves you in the emulator. And I flipped it backwards and it was the funniest thing that came out. We smell sausage. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I'm like, it just said we smell sausage. So I put in we smell sausage and it went into the emulator and it came back. Jesus loves you. It was so awesome. So anyhow, for all those that, that um have a, 
have a way to sample and flip the sample backwards, a vocal sample, try Jesus Love You or We Smell Sausage and you'll be equally pleased with your result. Now, you, you've really been beyond and back in, in ways that few of us can imagine. I mean, do you feel like now creatively re-energized and, and reborn? Well, you know what? Um, I'm lucky. I'm not a sports guy, you know, like sports figures. You can only do it for so long, you know, and um, actors, you get old, you know, and stay, keep old actors around for some things, but really people want to look at kids, you know, anyhow. Um, I just happen to be in this fortunate part of the business, um, and and I always liked it that, you know, we're not, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're at the front of the film, but we're not, you know, we're not up there with all the actors and the directors and the producers and all the really, really important people. You know, I'm, I'm the cobbler of music. So, you know, it's like, you know, you're, you're in there, but, you know, they just want to want you to get it. Oh, yeah. And somebody wrote that P. Hicks was, or somebody said P. Hicks was the guy he is. You know, he, he did the pan up. Um, uh, um, Oh, I just distracted myself by looking at. <laughs> yeah. So anyhow, so so it's like you can get old and be a composer. You know, it's like a lot of composers. Let's be let's be real about this. There's a lot of composers that just like collapse at the podium and uh, and it's like they don't stop the film. They, they go, oh, OK. Um, they go back in the uh, they, they go back to the control room and they go, is there somebody back there that could finish this cue while we take a. Uh, well, we escort Mr. Mother's Ba to the to the funeral home. You know, it's like um, it's uh, you know, it's one of those kind of jobs. So it's like it's it's not it's not glorified to be the composer, but it's like really satisfying for me because I get to be creative every day. And I, of all things, I get to write music. Who would have thought that? You know, I, when I was a kid, I was like, I always wanted to write music every day, but I didn't know if that was even possible. You know, I didn't know of a, of a profession that allowed that. So I now, stumbled on yeah. this, yeah. Um, you know, I have to admit, you know, when, uh, kind of my guilty pleasure show is Dirty John, and I was just so glued to the actual news stories that came, I just couldn't believe it. I was, like, trying to find out what happened. Um, yeah. In a way, you, you've scored two shows that kind of became part of the cultural zeitgeist between Tiger King and uh, Dirty John, these insane true life stories. Yeah, they were both very trashy. And um, I remember, uh, you know, when I got offered uh, Tiger, you know, Tiger King, I was kind of like, is that even possible that could be real? That was like such an, a, a crazy, crazy story. And then, you know, uh, it's one of the few you know, most of us all are unhappy that, that, uh, you know, the, the pandemic came along, but I think Tiger King benefited from it because it gave people something to look at while they were, um, trapped at home. No, yeah, for, for sure. And again, uh, you know, Dirty John, uh, you know, it's just a horrific, uh, story. Horrific. But again, it yeah, and the best you can do to, with a story like that is just play it straight, you know, mm -hmm. and let the story unfold. You know, for me, actually, you know, I, I, I one of my favorite films and scores you've done is Safe, the really fantastic Jason Statham film. I mean, do you, would you love to get my kind of more dramatic opportunities like that? Yeah, I would. You know, um, you know, it's like people are always looking at the last film you did and saying oh we need the person who did that who did that and then they then they hire you and so that's how i i had this long history with uh animation you know because once you do a couple and they're successful then then you know people keep coming back to you uh, for that same thing and they you know there's other people that have done you know either dramatic or or even horror films, you know, I, I, the only reason I got the horror film is just because I'd worked with uh, the director and producers before and they, they trusted me. So, 
you know, I, I think somebody that didn't know me, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't have been their first, they would have looked at my resume and I wouldn't have been their first choice necessarily. So, I mean, you know, Cocaine Bear did great this weekend. Um, and uh, pe people love the film. I, th I think they really got, you know, the joke uh, with it. Uh, so I guess to wrap it up, where do you see Cocaine Bear going? I mean, I'm sure there's got to be a sequel, you know, Fentanyl Ferret, you know, what, whatever. And I imagine you'll probably be back uh, to score the next adventures of whatever animal ingests a controlled substance. Where, where do you hope this whole kind of phenomenon goes in your music for it? Well, um, I think the bear was lucky. I, I think if you would have had um, cocaine reindeer or something or cocaine Bambi, uh, I don't think people would have the same response to it, you know, uh, because, but the bear is kind of like a big, you know, you know, you, you can imagine a bear doing a, a kilo of coke and then waking up with a hangover and then going, ah, oh, man, okay. Back to hibernation, you know, a, a bear, you don't think of it as damaging to the bear. So I don't know what animals you can, you could do that stuff with. I know you, you just said a uh, fentanyl ferret. Uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe uh, if somebody over universal is listening to this, they're, they're writing that down. I would, am I, and believe me, I'm certain that they are already thinking about sequels. You know, you know that that's how it works in, in this town. If something is successful, don't worry, they're going to try and milk it further. So I don't know. Maybe the maybe the Cubs grow up and go to college, and um, they they get involved with cocaine. You know, they might be it might be like a cross between uh, Catch Twenty One and uh, or um, or Twenty One Jump Street and uh, and um, a Cocaine Bear, where they 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 become undercover bear cubs, bear cops. I don't know. Well, Mark, you, write the, you write the treatment, you might get the you might get the the script. So give it a shot. Well, I'm sure we're gonna we're gonna get more of these. Mark, I just want to thank you so much for joining us at Film Music Live. Watch Cocaine Bear in theaters with Mark Mothersbaugh's soundtrack available on Backlot Music. And thanks to our producer Dale Turner and Mark Northam and Nicky Walsh, uh, Timothy. Of Tiffany Serapat and Ken Yu at Backlot Music. And I'll see you all on the next Film Music Live. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, you guys.